You're listening to the Sermon Podcast for the Peak Church, located in Apex, North Carolina. Our church is striving to welcome all who are feeling disconnected from God. And so our hope is that over the next several minutes, you will connect with the God that we are talking about, and you'll resonate deeply with the life that this God wants for you. We hope you enjoy. Friends, good morning again to you, Uh, and those of you who are here in person or tuning in for the very first time to our church online, welcome to The Peak. Today we are continuing a sermon series that we began last Sunday, a sermon series called Mixtapes. Mixtapes. For the next several weeks, we are exploring when, where, and how we have encountered uh, or uh, sort uh, sort of sensed the Spirit of God in and through the medium of music. All different types of music, by the way. For the next several weeks, we're going to go into all different genres of music. We're going to dig into punk rock. We're going to dig into oldies. We're going to dig into classical. Last week, we talked about where and how we've encountered God through pop. You can find the gospel in Justin Bieber, I'm telling you. Just dig. You got to dig. You got to dig a little bit, but you can find it, right? And today's no different. Today's no different. We're going to continue this conversation. We're going to talk about yet another genre, another genre of music uh, that has something to contribute, something powerful to contribute to the conversation, not only of what it means to be a human, what it means to be a person of faith. Today, we're going to dig into the genre of hip-hop, and we're going to kick off with a game, okay? Didn't know you are coming to church to play a game, but you're going to play a game, Okay. This game, you can play this at home, by the way. You can form teams really quickly. You can hit pause on YouTube and sort of like divvy up and uh, have a battle royale. Here we go. The game is called Who Said It? (laughs) Who Said It? Was it God or was it Kanye West? Okay. In just a moment, I'm going to put a series of statements on this screen and you... I would encourage you in the quietness of your own mind or row to disclose what your guess is. And then at the very end, pencils down, we will go over answers. Ready? Here we go. Okay? I feel like you're going to walk away either feeling really good about your faith today or very confused. Here we go. Okay, so first statement. Who said it? I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Who said it? No cheating. Don't turn to your neighbor. Number two. I feed the branches of the people. Was that God? Or was it Kanye? Number three, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. God or Kanye? Some of you are feeling real confident. Like I'm watching, you're like, oh, I'm three for three, baby. Here we go. (laughs) Number four, I live and breathe every element of life. Every element of life. And then fifthly and finally, everyone who has heard and learned from me comes to me. All right? Pencils down. Scantrons flipped over. Okay? Here we go. All right? We're not going to do raise of hands uh, just for the sake of our own dignity here today, but here we go. I'm dead serious. Amanda did one of these with me a couple of months ago, and I missed a couple. And so uh, it was one of the most humbling moments I've ever had as a preacher. I'd like reevaluate my uh, existence. So here we go. I am the light of the world. Was that God or was that Kanye? Answer, it was God. John chapter 8. Jesus, I am the light of the world. Number two, I feed the branches of the people. This one was tricky, dog. Jesus uses some branch stuff. He talks about trees. He talks about roots. But it was Kanye West. All right. Number three, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. (laughs) Oh, that's so good. That was God. That was God. That was Jesus. John chapter 8. Oh, Lord. Number four, I live and breathe every element of life. Again, this sounds like something Jesus might say, but it's Kanye. That's Kanye West. And then fifth and finally, everyone who has heard and learned from me comes to me. John chapter six, this is Jesus as well. All right, give yourselves a round of applause so you can at least hide how many that you missed so no one else knows. Five for five, yeah, 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 totally, 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 totally. So Kanye's a little out there, 
Okay, Kanye's a little out there. But let us be very, very quick to follow up with the statement of saying, this should not and cannot nullify. How many brilliant artists there are out there in the genre of hip hop? There are a ton of artists out there that have had so many things to say, not only about the human experience, but the existential experience. And if we're open to it, they can not only enrich and teach us things about ourselves that we don't know, but might, in fact, be God's way of reaching us and showing and teaching us things about God that we don't know. Case in point will come in just a couple of moments. Before we get there, uh, we're actually going to return to our scripture passage for today. So if you have your Bibles with you or you've got your smart devices with you and you want to follow along as we dig into our scripture passage for today, or again, if you're watching this online, you want to make sure you uh, have a chance to snag a Bible, go ahead and hit pause and grab uh, the Bible, because today uh, we're going to be camped out in Psalm chapter 8. I shared last week that over the course of this entire sermon series, we're going to be camped out in what's called a poetic literature poetic literature. So uh, just like music has different genres, there's also books of the Bible that have different genres. And there's uh, what's called poetry in the Bible. This is books like the Psalms, books like Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, you name it. And sometimes these are diary entries. Some of these, sometimes these are poems. Sometimes these are like angry letters from their soul to another person or to God. Or sometimes, like in the case of Psalm chapter 8, what's written in these passages It's meant to be a song, song. This psalm is meant to be a song. How do I know that? Well, because if you back up and actually look at the way in which this chapter starts to begin with, you get evidence of this, right? So we didn't have this read a couple moments ago. Joy didn't read this portion. But if you have your Bibles with you, uh, most of the time, how psalms will start, or oftentimes how psalms will start is it'll read something like this. It'll say, before you read it, this is for the music leader. This is for the worship leader. This should be played according to the giddith. The giddith. Anybody got any giddiths at home? Anybody got any? Anybody want to take a guess what a giddith is? Some of you are like, bro, after the guessing I just did in that last quiz, I'm going to be quiet the rest of this service. I ain't giving you nothing for the rest of this morning service. Giddith. The G uh, is actually your hint there. This is actually an ancient guitar. An ancient guitar. It looks kind of something like this. Kind of something like this. Uh, this psalm, when David wrote this psalm, He instructed whenever this psalm is read, it should be a song, read, played, sung with this instrument. Now, why does that matter? Like, who cares? Uh, I'll tell you uh, why it matters. If you do a little digging and you start to understand uh, the historical and the cultural significance of why David specifically wanted that instrument played while that psalm was being read, you'll find the giddith. Uh, was actually the favorite musical instrument of the people of Gath. Gath is a town, it's a city located in the, uh, the Philistine Empire, the, the nation of Philistia. So one of the things that, uh, if those of you who uh, you weren't raised in church, so you're like, what in the world is all that? Um, the people of God lived in Israel. And they were constantly battling neighboring nations. They were suffering conflicts with other nations. A big one was Philistia. You hear a lot of scriptures in the Old Testament talking about, oh, Israel's getting into it with the Philistines again. They're getting into it with the Philistines again. And it was because the Philistines oftentimes were more powerful. They were stronger. And so they would oppress the people of Israel. They would harm the people of Israel. They would go to war and steal things and steal land and and harm uh, the people of Israel. And so constantly they're reflecting upon this conflict throughout much of scripture. And so, let's put all the context clues together. Let's put all the context clues together. Because this is a psalm that you just heard read. It's a joyful psalm, isn't it? It's a celebratory psalm. It's one that's talking about victory. It's one that's talking about freedom. And so, what does it mean that David said, whenever you sing this psalm, I want you to use the instrument of the enemy... This people we don't like that are always oppressing us and harming us. I want you to sing this song with that instrument. Because one of the things that we know, what do we know about David? What was his most famous exchange with the Philistines? One particular Philistine. Goliath. Good job. Anyone want to take a guess where Goliath is from? Gath. He's from this town. And so you put all of it together. Put all of it together, and what you begin to see is, holy cow, maybe, just maybe, David wrote this psalm 
right after they defeated Goliath, right after they defeated the Philistines, and they were singing it as a song of, yes, we believe in a God who always stands up for us, always rescues us, always, always stands up for the, the marginalized and the oppressed, the people who are being mistreated. God comes to the aid of those who are suffering, just like he did for us. Again, what does it say? Uh, go back to Psalm chapter 8. You have laid a strong foundation, be, strong foundation because of your foes in order to stop your vengeful enemies. Now we know who he's talking about, who he's talking about right? And so he's saying, what are, he's talking to God now, God, what are human beings uh, that you think about us, that you even pay attention to us? You know what this sounds a lot like? This sounds a lot like what we read in Exodus chapter 2, when here in that moment, Exodus, the people of God are being oppressed, they're being harmed uh, by another nation, this time it's Egypt, but it says this, the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help went up to God. God heard their groaning and came to their aid. And so this psalm is David celebrating that the God that we worship is one that comes to the aid of those who are being mistreated, those who are being oppressed. And this is a beautiful moment to now loop in hip-hop. Because, friends... Uh, today, what we're going to do is we're going to cover two themes, two themes in the genre of hip-hop that I think you will find a lot of deep, deep, close parallels in Scripture, the first of which you just heard. Friends, one of the ways in which God uses hip-hop music in this world, in society, and in culture today, one of the ways is to be a powerful voice for justice, for equality, for peace, for standing up for and righting wrongs where you see that going on in different pockets and places in our country and in our world. I could think of numerous examples of this. The first one I thought of was Jay-Z. So Jay-Z writes uh, in his collaboration with Coldplay, my favorite band, uh, in this song, uh, he, he's reflecting upon, he's reflecting upon what it's like to be a black male in America. And I, this ending, I was, she's talking about success. It's like, it doesn't actually matter how much success I accumulate in this life. The more, it's almost like the more I succeed, the more I feel like people are trying to bring me down. And you see this at the very end. Every step I take, they try to remind me, no, this is where you're from. This is who you are. He's reflecting upon what so many persons of color in this country experience. The New York Times did a study, uh, actually, I think it was a couple of years ago, uh, and they uh, followed over 100 uh, teenagers of color. And they asked them, they said, hey, like we're trying to understand how often you might encounter direct or indirect forms of discrimination uh, in life. And so they followed them and they would ask them these questions and sometimes they were overt forms, they were direct forms, and sometimes they were sort of microaggressions of it. Uh, regardless, they found this, this is staggering, that when the teenagers came back after a couple months, they found that on average, this is on average, so some experienced more, on average, the average teenager experienced racial discrimination five times a day. Five times a day. One of the gifts that hip-hop gives to us, whether we want to receive it or not, is hip-hop helps us see things, maybe because of our own experience, because of our own background, we wouldn't know what's going on. Or God is also using hip-hop sometimes to reveal things to us we don't want to see in us or in our societies. Tupac did this all the time. Tupac was brilliant at this. He used to talk about not only what his experience was like as an individual, but he would often also reflect upon what he was witnessing, not only in our country, but in countries. This was like humanity writ large. In his song, Keep Your Head Up, he says this. He says, you know, it's funny, when it rains, it pours. They got money for wars, but can't feed the poor. He's observing that oftentimes when he looks around, again, not just at America, but looks around at the world, he sees a country, he sees countries, he sees a humanity that oftentimes says one thing and does another. 
their actions clash with their values. And so one of the gifts that God uses hip-hop to perform in the world is the gift of accountability. I don't care who you are. Everybody needs accountability. You need people in your life who will hold you accountable that you are doing and living and acting in the ways in which you are speaking, right? And just to be super clear about something, before you're like, eh, well, that's just like, that's just hip-hop, that's just music, that's just culture. That's biblical, baby. That's biblical. Again, if you are new to, like, studying the Bible and trying to understand it, there's another genre uh, in the biblical writings called uh, prophetic literature. Prophetic literature. These are all the prophets, particularly in the Old Testament. And over and over and over again, they are given the very unpopular job of being raised up by God to go and confront people in power to tell them how their society and their world and their actions are directly contradicting with the kingdom of God that they say that they're about. Just check out these examples, right? This is just a, this is just a couple. Isaiah chapter 1. Learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, plead the case to the widow. Why is he saying that? Because they ain't doing that, right? Amos chapter 5, verse 24, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. That sounds beautiful. That sounds poetic. Go and read Amos like homeboy was coming for them. Like, it's a very critical book talking about how the people of God are acting in direct contrast to who God's called them to be. And then uh, what's written on so many uh, young Christians tattooed on their wrists. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. You want to call yourself a Christian, you want to call yourself a follower of Jesus, that's fine. Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with God. One of the things I love about the prophetic literature is that, um, so according to the Bible, prophets are not future tellers. So that's when we use the word prophet nowadays in our culture. We think, oh, prophets are people who can, like, tell the future. Actually, according to the Bible, they're not future tellers. They're truth tellers. It's someone who can mirror back to you the truth of who you are or who you've been lately. And so in some ways we might think of some of these hip-hop artists as modern-day prophets, revealing truths to us that we couldn't or don't want to see. So let's just put it on the ground, okay? Let's put it all the way on the ground and make it practical for you today. Ask yourself this question. What truths... hmm, Okay, Kyle. What truths have I been resisting lately? What truths have people been trying to demonstrate and reveal to me lately that I wouldn't, didn't want any part of? What voices of truth have I been silencing lately? Seriously, maybe for you it's like just personal. It's just like familial. Maybe for you it's like your kid. The most honest person in my life is my five-year-old. Sometimes I'm open for that truth, and sometimes he can shove it. Anyway, maybe for you it's a kid. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's your employer. Maybe it's uh, someone you care about deeply in your life, that they're, every time you're around them recently, they've been revealing something, directly or indirectly, to you, about you. That's just hard to receive. Or again, maybe it is someone you don't even associate with very often. Maybe it's someone of a different religion. Maybe it's someone different who votes differently than you. Maybe it's someone who is of a different race. Maybe it's someone whose experience has been very, very different than yours. And whenever they share, something gets triggered in you, and you don't want to make room for maybe, just maybe, what they're saying is real. And here's the danger in that, okay? You can do that. But here's the danger in that. If God is using prophets and truth-tellers to reveal things to you about yourself, number one, God's doing it because God loves you. 
and God cares about you and doesn't want you to live a lie for the rest of your life to your and the world's detriment. That's number one. But number two, if you silence those truth tellers in your life long enough, by silencing them, you're silencing the voice of God. And you maybe just one day might wake up and realize you can't hear God anymore. You don't even know what God's trying to say to you anymore. Because you have developed this robust list of strategies for shutting that ish down. Whenever it tries to creep in. What truths have you been resisting lately? That's the first uh, gift. <laughs> Uh, that hip-hop uh, gives to us. The second one is this. The second one is this. And I, with the remainder of our time, I do want to spend some time on the second one because I want to really do the genre of hip-hop justice today. Um, because God not only uses uh, the artists of hip-hop to uh, do something critical and, and something challenging to each and every one of us individually. Here's the good news. The good news and the, and the, fo- the fun news, the joyous news, is that God also uses hip-hop to do the exact opposite as well. The other really big theme you'll find in hip-hop music is not only sort of like a critical, challenging sort of reflection upon the human experience and injustice and oppression, those sorts of things, but on the flip side of that, one of the things that you'll also, one of the big themes you'll also find in hip-hop music is this radical message of self-love, of self-worth, of uh, self-validation. One of the things that you'll find over and over again in this music is this permission giving to love yourself even if everyone else doesn't. And once again, we see that theme in Scripture, do we not? We see that in Scripture. We see that in our very Scripture for today. He's reflecting. David's reflecting upon his own experience. He's reflecting upon this, and he's saying, holy cow, like, you've, like, we are, like, these magical, mystical beings. You've made us only slightly less than the divine. You've crowned us with glory and grandeur, and you've given us a job to rule over your handiwork. You put everything under our feet. You know what this sounds like? This sounds like another passage, another psalm David wrote, Psalm 139, where he says this. He's reflecting upon himself, and he's like, wow. Like, when I think and I marvel at all of the intricacies and the complexities of us as humans and what you've given to us and the gifts and the talents, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Holy cow. I am this beautiful thing. And there are so many hip-hop artists who are trying to pierce the lies that we have believed about ourselves for so long to break in and share the truth that you, my beloved, are the same. That you are beautiful children of God as well. TLC wrote a little something about this. Some of y'all know TLC from their hit song, no Scrubs, that's Amanda's favorite anthem. I feel like that's uh, also any woman in this room who has broken up with anybody uh, that was on your top five songs that you listened to. Kelly Clarkson, uh, Since You've Been Gone, that's probably like number one, number two. Um, I would sing all of these for you, but YouTube's got copyright stuff and I'll probably yank this down. So don't do it, YouTube. Anyway, um, but they got another song. So they got another song. TLC had another song uh, that they put out uh, roughly about the same time, but it didn't get nearly as much airtime. And the song was called Unpretty. Unpretty. And it was there reflecting upon the experience of being made to feel ugly by someone else in their life. They wrote these words. Uh, they said, they're, you know, I'm never, I was never insecure until I met you. I used to be cute to me. And then look at this bottom line. Maybe if I get rid of you, then I'll get back to me. What I love so much about what they're trying to create for the listener here is they're trying to create for the listener an opportunity to love themselves again despite what they've been told, despite all the criticism that's come their way. There's probably no better artist who is having more effect and more powerful transforming sort of effect upon the world in this particular arena than Lizzo herself. Got any Lizzo fans out there? 
That's the about darn time. That's the Christian version. Okay. That's the kid bop version. Okay. So uh, she's got a song. She's got a song called Excuse Me. And uh, she writes this, mirror, mirror. I'm not going to try to uh, uh, do Lizzo. Okay. So mirror, mirror on the wall. Tell me what you see. Uh, it's that. Oh, my God. It's looking heavenly. One of the things I love so much about Lizzo is that she is demonstrating for us that sometimes there is nothing more revolutionary than choosing to defiantly love yourself and love the parts of yourself that other people have told you, they've trained you to hate. One of my favorite songs from Kendrick Lamar, the refrain, the chorus, just says, I love myself. I love myself. I'm going to forget what all them people have said about me, what the people in my past, what society. I'm going to forget all that. I love myself. These artists are reminding us that it's not only good, it's not only healthy, but it's faithful. It's godly to love yourself. And as I'm looking out on y'all, like right now, and I, I can only assume the, tr- the same is true for those who are tuning in online, like, I know that no matter who you are, every single one of us, every single one of us, at one point or another, we were told, we were taught, we were trained to hate, hide, sever a part of ourselves that didn't fit in in that particular setting we were occupying. Some of you know firsthand how hard it is, how unbelievably challenging it is to love yourself, all of yourself. Again, maybe you've had years of experience with this, years of maybe a parent or an ex or a coach or a teacher or a pastor teach you that you ought to be ashamed and hide and bury that part of yourself. Maybe it's your personality. Maybe you've always, oh, he's just too much. Ugh. Or she's just too much. Ugh, too loud. Or maybe for you it's body image. Maybe for you there's a part of your body that's just like always been a part of this. Maybe for you it's been your worldview, the way in which you see things, the way in which you tackle and approach conversations and issues in the world. Maybe for you it's your passion. There's a passion in your life, thing that you care about a lot, but for whatever reason, the settings you've been placed in, those people didn't share that same passion, so you had to quiet that. You had to sort of squander that fire because you didn't want anyone else to look at you like a fool. And friends, I'm passionate about this. One of our missions here at this church, one of the reasons we show up to church is because part of our job is to remind you when you have forgotten what you're made of. You want to know what you're made of? Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 reads, says this, So God created humankind in his own image, and in the image of God he created them. Friends, you were not just made by God, you are made of God. Me? Everybody. And so how radical is this? That actually, by loving yourself, you're loving God. You're loving the God in you. Now, I'll close here. Friends, because this is, this is not uh, just like a throwaway sermon where we're just going to sort of like, mm, I just want to feel good about, mm. um, this, is, this is our mission. This is a mission problem. That if you don't love you, we're failing in helping you love God fully. Because you can love God directly, and you will also learn to love God indirectly through loving your neighbor and through loving yourself. And the longer we go without loving ourselves, 
the less effective we are to the mission to which God has called us. And so if you came here today and you got some, if this resonates even in the slightest, tiniest bit with a portion or part of your personality of who you are or whatnot, we're going to get real practical as we close today. I want to give you tools that if you came here today and you're like, man, that sounds great, Kyle, I love it myself, but I've been training myself for 37 years to hate this part of who I am. So it's going to take a me minute, okay? Going to need some tools. Going to need some, uh, what you got in the tool belt. So let's, let's sort of like, let's show you those apps, right? So if you are someone who's trying to love God through yourself better, number one, number one, the first place you can do that, we get this in the scripture, the first place you can start is knowing and using your God-given gifts. Knowing and using your God-given gifts. Psalm 8 says this, that God, God, you've made us a little bit less than the divine. You made us only made us mortals just a little bit, just a little bit lower, and you've given us. You've, cha- you've given us charge of everything you've made. You've put every single thing under our authority. Translation, you were made on purpose for a purpose. Not just, when you come to church, it's not just the pastors. It's not just the uber spiritual people. Like, oh, they've got the calling. They've got the purpose. This applies to every single human being out there. You have something God needs in the world. And so part of how you love yourself is you let that part actually come out. Let that part actually come out, make a difference and change and help and transform this world that we've been called to serve. Now, some of you are like, you know, I, I am, I'm good, actually. Like, I know my gifts, and, like, <laughs> I use them, actually, all the time. So um, I'm good. That's great. If you don't, if you don't, no shame. But one of the things that keeps me up at night as a pastor is that question, are we helping people not not only just gain more information and knowledge about God, but am I helping you understand what God has put in you for the sake of the world? And that's part of how you love yourself and love God through yourself. So if you're like, again, if you're like, Kyle, I don't even know where to start. Like, how do you even figure that out? Again, we're getting super practical tools from the tool belt. Here we go. The first step, you want to do that? You want to do that. You want to love God by knowing and using your gifts? Again, you got to know them. you got to figure out what the heck they are, okay? So start here. Start here. We give this link to every single person who becomes a member of this church because part of our job when you become a member of this church is for us to help you figure out what God has already implanted in you to be of service to the world. So write that link down. You can find it in the sermon notes also afterward. But if you go to this link, you'll find a spiritual gift inventory. You'll punch in all of the, you'll answer all the 40 questions, and then it'll give you, it'll say literally, here are your gifts. And again, this is biblical. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Ephesians chapter 4, it says every single one of us, we've got these things. Maybe they're living dormant in us, but they're in there. We've got to bring them to life. I'll never forget a couple of years ago, someone took this and they wrote me later and they said, I never knew that God gave me the gift of compassion. But now that this inventory showed it to me, I'm like looking back on my life and I'm like, holy cow, I totally have that. I feel most alive when I'm helping people who feel isolated, alone, in need of help. And so I'm going to do it. And she started doing it inside the church. And she started doing it outside the church. She didn't even ask my permission. And please, for the love of God, don't ask my permission. You don't need my permission to be the church. But if you want to love yourself, first is knowing, and then you got to use them. Okay, so the first step's easy. You can do this later while you're just sitting there watching TV, right? You can do this in 40 minutes, 30 minutes, 20 minutes. I can't remember. It actually takes like 20 minutes. Second step is harder. Once you do this, second step, ask God for an assignment. And this is where many of us stop. We'll do step one. Oh, that's cool. Like, I've got teaching abilities. (laughs) But then you got to do step two. You have to dare, dare. I dare you to fill this out and then ask God, where do you need this in the world? And you'll get an answer. You want to love yourself, know 
and use your gifts. Or maybe that's not you today. Maybe that's not you today. Maybe you uh, actually, you feel like you've got a lot of meaning and purpose in life. You feel like the work that you do and the places you volunteer and serve, like you feel like you're actually giving a lot to the world. You're using what God has given you. Maybe that's not where you are today. Maybe for you, the call to love yourself is a more general one. Back to what we were just talking about a moment ago. Maybe for you, today is about choosing from this day forward to say no more. No more. I'm going to unabashedly, I'm going to defiantly love and appreciate the parts of myself that everybody, it seems, around me has been telling me to hide, mask, or sever. I'm going to love and appreciate those things. Maybe for the first time in my life. And again, if that's you and you're like, I don't even know where to start, like where do you even begin something like that? Again, I'm going to give you a tool, okay? I'm going to give you a tool. It's probably our most often used tool here in church. How we uh, do this uh, is we bless stuff. We just bless the crap out of stuff here. That's what what church is all about. (laughs) If ever you're like, what what do churches do? We just bless the crap out of stuff. That's all. That's literally it. And so my encouragement to you is that if this rings true, if you've got you know, parts of your personality or, again, maybe it's bodily image or maybe it's the way you think or the way you act or the things you're passionate about, maybe there's just never been appreciated, never been cared for, and you want to love those things again. You want to love God through loving those again. I want to encourage you uh, some to consider, to consider offering two blessings, okay? Offering two blessings The first one, you're not going to like, okay? First one, you're not going to like. First one's going to make you mad, okay? I'm just saying this so you don't throw anything at me. First one I want you to consider is I want you to consider blessing the people who trained you to hate that part of yourself. I can feel the anger in this room. I can feel it online. You guys are doing it too. You're just... I want to encourage you to consider blessing the people who taught you to hate those parts of yourself. Why? Because Jesus has something to say about your enemies. He says you are to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Why? Why? Because in Jesus' genius, he understood that if you do that, two things will happen. Number one, You'll stop the cycle. You'll stop repeating the same thing that was done to you. You'll stop passing on that hatred and that criticism and all of that scrutiny that you received from your parents or from someone else onto your children or to whoever else you have influence. You'll break the cycle. And number two, you're just going to have to trust me on this, that if you do it long enough, the power that those critical voices used to have over you, they will lessen. You're just going to have to trust me on that. The more you pray for your haters, the less power their voices will have over you. Now, I'm just going to give you a quick disclaimer. If you choose to do this, the first time you do it, you totally won't mean it. You know what I'm saying? You'll pray for the person who's been hating on you and has been persecuting you, and you will not mean a single word. Like, you'll just be like, okay, all right, I'm here, not because I want to be, but because that <clears throat> Kyle asked me to be here, so here we go. I'm going to pray for my coworker. Um, hate her. <laughs> so maybe you can save her from all of her awfulness. Amen. Okay, great. Oh, he's right. That feels better. <laughs> You didn't do it right, okay? But that's fine. That's fine. The first couple times, you're going to get it wrong, okay? And you're not going to feel like it. But I just need you to trust me on this. The more I have chosen to pray for my persecutors, over time, sometimes it's not until six months, a year even, sometimes three or four. I know it's discouraging. But the more you pray and you bless your persecutors, the less power they will have over your life. And the second person I want to encourage you and invite you to bless starting today is you. 
okay? Am I allowed to do that? Like, am I allowed to go, bless myself? Yes, you actually are, uh, actually. Um, I don't know if you knew this. I don't even know, if, did you even know that you can bless people? You thought that God is the only one that blesses us. No, no, no. Psalm also says, there's a psalm that says, uh, bless the Lord, O my soul, okay? So that means we actually have the ability to bless other people and to even bless ourselves. And so I want to encourage you to prayerfully consider maybe offering a blessing to yourself, offering a blessing, particularly over those areas that you have forsaken, that you've masked, that you've pretended didn't exist, because it was just easier that way. Maybe do the corny teenage girl thing and like write a letter to yourself. Dear Kyle, I'm sorry. I'm serious. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for, from hiding you for the world. No more. No more. Worship team, you can go and come on up. Um, because today, before we leave, if you're like, okay, you know, I'll bite, um, but I'm scared. I'm scared. Kyle, you don't understand. Like, I, I did love that part of myself before. And it got stomped on. I did appreciate that part of myself before. And I got taken advantage of. Like, I don't... I don't want to do this, and I definitely don't want to do it alone. Here's the good news. You're not going to do it alone, okay? We're going to do this together. In just a moment, I'm going to put a prayer. I'm going to put a blessing on the screens. Screen, uh, the blessing is written by author and theologian Kate Bowler. Some of you know her stuff. Kate Bowler has written a lot of really, really good books. Everything Happens, No Cure for Being Human. She's one of my professors at Divinity School. And during the pandemic, she started writing blessings. She's like... The world's a crap show, so I'm just going to start blessing stuff. And she wrote this blessing. This blessing is a blessing for when you can't love yourself. And we're going to say this blessing together, okay? You're not going to do it alone. You're not alone. We're going to do this together. Okay? Let's stand. And let us pray. God, I don't love myself, so how can anyone else? God, maybe I can borrow some of your mercy as I unfold to you the unloveliness within. Maybe as I hand it all over, I can borrow some of your gentleness and grace to use for myself, to help me absorb some of the love you have for me, to metabolize it so I can breathe freely in my own company. Oh, how blessed is the realization that you call me the beloved and choose to live with me on purpose. We have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. Inhaling this truth gives life to everything else. Last part. So may you set aside straining toward perfection in the abstract and help me to live simply in Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to the Peak Podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever podcasts can be found. For more information on how to get connected with our church, please visit us at thepeakchurch.org.